way to send the process. So we have contacted them and they have sent the best. They've sent Jamie McPherson uh, from the New York State School Boards Association located in Lincoln, New York. Um, and uh, we will uh, we'll distribute the goal setting process. We'll see you in about a couple hours. Yes. And why don't we just go around and introduce ourselves? And ladies are on this placards here, but uh, we'll just go ahead and introduce ourselves. I'm Robert Moore, the superintendent of schools. To my left is Mary Mandel, the assistant superintendent for business affairs. And you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, Pamela King, uh, new board member, newest board member, the first official class. Very nice. Paul Petrowski, starting the third year on the board. Sure, speak. That's Lisa Phillipson, starting my eighth year at work. First meet you again, that's one. Amy Allen, I have an assistant Excellent. And Jamie has a copy of our goals update that we presented back in June for 2013 2014. Did I give you a copy of the draft goals that, you know, that we have developed that we have put together? Or? That one I did not get. Okay, that's okay. But that's okay. They sort of mirror what the goals update was and, and the goals. But, um, Absolutely. So at this point, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, I don't know if you want to do it. We are in an open session, correct? That is correct. It's you want to do it. It's up to you if you want to do it. You know, we'll do it at our, our business meeting. That yeah, works so. for me. Do you have another copy? Of I paper do. Paper? I'm actually going to give you mine. Uh, that was one short. Okay. But I'm just going to lead everybody through and then I'll hand that to you. Yeah, that's that's okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me to New Hartford. Uh, it's great to be back here. We have very good friends and family who live in New Hartford. So I know uh, firsthand how great a school district this is very high performing school district. Sometimes we do get board members from a high performing school district. They don't necessarily see per se the importance of goal setting. So I'm very happy that you brought me in today to kind of lead you through some of the best practices. And I'll touch base on that in just a minute. But just to give you some background information about myself, originally from Saratoga Springs, went to the University of Albany. I uh, got my master's degree in teaching from Union College. Go Dutchman, they just want if you follow hockey at all. <laughs> Absolutely, so uh, very excited uh, about that. That's where I met my lovely wife. I uh, was a teacher for 10 years before I joined the New York State School Boards Association. I've been with them for about two years now. One of my primary functions that I do, I do the uh, New School Board Member Academy, so if you're going to be attending that in Albany or Buffalo or wherever, I will be running that and I most likely will see you again. We also have our online course as well. But I love coming out and working with boards one-on-one -on -one in a retreat setting like this. This to me is the most hands-on, the most beneficial. Plus, I love getting out of the office. I have a little tiny office that overlooks the doorway. My favorite pastime is watching cars get pulled over. It's about the extent of it. <laughs> So today, really, what we, <laughs> thank you. I, I got bad jokes. If you laugh, that's okay. If you don't, trust me. I taught 10 years in middle school. Uh, let me just first of all lead you through what's inside your folders, kind of give you a sense of where we're going to be heading. If you look over on the left side, you already have a name placard out, so you can disregard this yellow sheet. At the end of today's session, if you could just do me the courtesy of filling out the evaluation, give me a little bit of feedback in terms of how I did, um, any, any suggestions that you may have to help me improve as a facilitator in the future. There is a meeting observation form. I don't think we'll necessarily need this, but this is just standard in terms of what they put in here. And then they give you this yellow sheet workshop protocol, and I never use that and make it keep it in it. On the right-hand side, we just have a cover sheet. I have a copy of today's PowerPoints you can follow along, you can write notes. I really do encourage you to ask questions along the way. I have what is referred to as a SWOT analysis. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it at all. It sounds like you are, which is good. Um, I have a copy, and I, I made this myself. This is your mission, your vision, and your priorities. So we'll kind of put that in the back burner. I brought some samples of other district goals. Uh, Shenandoah is the largest school district in our area is enormous. It looks like a college campus to a certain degree. Um, Boston Spa is actually where my father taught, so I'm kind of biased in providing this to you, but I really like the way that Boston Spa has laid out their goals. And I did have a very nice conversation with Mr. Knoll. I will say, a lot of the best practices that I'm going to be going through today I'm hoping that you're gonna nod your head and say, yeah, you know what, we are doing this. 
but in the same degree, you also have a brand new member. So I'm probably going to add some things to this that maybe you already know, but this is great edification, and it's really great to help orient your new member because she will be participating in that goal setting process. And as I mentioned, I really would like you to you know, ask questions. So what I hope to accomplish today is I'm gonna lead you through my PowerPoint presentation. I will try not to be that guy that reads verbatim off of that. I really dislike that. I know we can all read. However, there are points where it does warrant a couple things up there. Um, I would like you to lead you through sort of the process and one of the things that I need to say, and it's kind of my disclaimer, the process that we advocate, this is an inclusive process that involves your superintendent. Some boards will create goals and they do not involve their superintendent. I also advocate that you not only involve your superintendent, but you involve other individuals that is going to add value to your goal setting process. It is gonna help pinpoint the areas within the district that you deem to be the highest priority. A lot of other districts, and this is up, and this is really up to you. And again, I offer you suggestions, whether or not you take them. It's really there's no one size fits all method. It's really for you guys to take what I offer and then start carving it out. But there are districts that will actually survey parents, faculty member, administrators, and they'll use that in part of their goal setting mix. And so really that's something that I advocate for. You are representatives of the community. You should be aware of the perceptions, the thoughts of what people have about this district because that input becomes extremely vital in that goal setting process. Obviously your school board were bound in the open meeting law, but goal setting needs to be transparent as well. And so another thing that I bring to the plate and I, I believe that you're already doing it, it's just periodically throughout the year you're receiving reports. How are you progressing towards those goals? Have those key individuals who have knowledge come in, you schedule it on your agenda. The other thing that I'm gonna to bring to the plate, and I, I don't believe you have it, but a lot of school districts, I should say a lot of boards, are gravitating towards this concept. They have a board-specific calendar. It's not your district calendar. This is specifically for you. At the beginning of the year, it is pre-populated because as a school board member, we know that there are certain times of the year in which certain topics are going to be addressed. For example, the budget. We know every year it's a cycle. So what they do, and what a lot of boards have become accustomed to, is they pre-populate it with all their known dates of when uh, certain topics are gonna come to light. As they progress through, they're also gonna schedule times in which they're gonna have individuals it might be your superintendent, it might be your business official, come and update you on progressing towards those goals. The calendar is great in the sense that a lot of uh, school districts, I'm sorry, a lot of school boards will put it on their website. It's great communicating to the public. So the public has an idea of what topics are on the horizon. And it's also good for board members because if you want something added to the agenda and there's a similar topic further down the road, you'll know that and then you can request that it be put on the agenda. I'm not sure the process that you undergo, but I'm sure that's something you're gonna share with your new member. And you might wanna piggyback it onto the topic that is already there as a way of efficiency. I not only wanna lead you through some of the best practices, but I want you to get a little bit entrenched in starting to think about goal setting, thinking about ways in which you would like to do your goals, thinking about a process. And ultimately, one of the things that I want you to think about maybe in the future is that once you have sort of solidified a process, you might want to consider, and a lot of boards are gravitating towards this, having an operation and procedures manual. And basically what that would do is it would basically cover something like goal setting. It would give you a nice outline of the process that you use. So when you do have board turnover, you can provide that manual to that individual and say, here is how we as a board have agreed to operate. I will say it is not tied to your district policy. Policy is policy. What I'm advocating for, and I can provide you a copy from the Maranac School District, they have a very nice one. It's just really how you conduct business. And so if you have an individual who maybe is not following sort of that outline, you can remind them, this is how we agreed to conduct business in public. And so, I will forward that on if you are interested in it. 
So where I really would like to start today, I like this, if you're familiar with Yogi Berra, all this little uh, inspirational quotes of wisdom. Yogi Berra once said, if you don't know where you are going, you'll end up someplace else. If we think about his quote and we tie it to goal setting, what do you think that means? If we apply that quote to setting district goals, what do you think that might mean? If you don't know where you are going. If you don't have a goal in sight, if you don't have a big to, to strive for, then you're going to sort of gear off and not sort of keep your eye on that ball. Excellent, and thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're 100% correct. Goals are important because as a board, one of your roles is to be forward focused. Yes, it's important to be cognizant of what's happening in education, what's happening in your specific district, but in the same degree, boards are future focused. Goals help lead you into that future. And if you really don't have an idea of where this school district is heading, that might be reflective in your goal setting process. All too often, I, I refer to them as sort of the flavor of the year goals. As a teacher, I remember hearing very vaguely that the board set goals. Most of the time, I didn't know what those goals were. And so what I'm saying to you is that if you think about your goal setting process and you take a step back and you think internally, that if somebody from the community were to come up and ask you about the goals that you set for the prior year, would you A, be able to articulate to that individual what the goals were, and then B, be able to articulate what progress you made to them? And I'm not putting you on the spot, it's just food for thought. One of the things that we really advocate in the goal setting process, and we call it cascading goals, I take it from the corporate world. Goals are set at the top, and they are put through the system all the way down to the bottom. If you want to see real results, you need to let people know that we're all on the same page, that here are the goals that we are working for. As the board, we have agreed to support those goals in any which, any which manner we can. It's really incumbent upon the superintendent to put the action plan in place. What are the steps? Your job as the board is to monitor that, to make sure that they are reaching those desired results in which you have set forth with them. And that's why we advocate for a process that involves the superintendent and other individuals. How, how often should you go over the goals? How, you know, in the now, that really is dependent upon sort of the board and your comfort level. A lot of boards will say, well, if we're gonna do it once a quarter, we're gonna carve out a time in which we're gonna have feedback about those, about how we're progressing to them. Others will have a mid-year informal evaluation. And I say informal because it is not, unless it's written in the contract for the superintendent, it's just merely having a conversation. And really the importance of behind this is that how many times have you guys found out that you, know, you did something and then realized later that if you had been told something else, that the end result could have been very different? All too often that's happened to me. The idea here is that by getting that feedback, you can gauge whether or not you're on track. You can then adjust, make those adjustments necessary instead of waiting to the end of the year to say, you know what? we really weren't watching their goals and now it's too late to do really anything about it. And so really as part of the conversation when you sit down and talk about the process itself, you wanna think how often are we going to have feedback? And it may be a goal by goal case scenario where you'll say we need to have feedback here. Does that make sense? I hope that, okay, perfect. We, we have a mid-year goal report in December and a mid-year goal report in June and we also have committees five standing committees that report out on the goals to the committee chair of people and then report out to the full board of board of education meetings. And those are done semi-annually and then annually uh, leading up to the June meeting. Excellent. So now I talked a little bit about the importance of goal setting, at least from my viewpoint. What I would like you to do is give me a little feedback from your perspective. What is the importance of setting district goals? We already said one of the important pieces that we want to bring into the mix is that allows us to stay focused. What are some of the other benefits of setting goals for the district as a board? Plan for the future. Plan for the future, I like that. And that's 100% correct. What else could we add to this? 
we can be consistent and all on the same page. Oh, I like that. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm going to put unity. Can you give us a criteria by which to evaluate issues as they arise? Ah. Whether or not they're in keeping with our goals. Well, not only to evaluate, also individuals as well. Mm. So, you know what? I, I hear evaluate. Let's put accountability. Would that be acceptable? Yep. Anything else we could add to that list? Mentioned historic record. Ah, historic record. Even as a communications tool to the community you were talking about before. Excellent. Anything else we could add to that before we move forward? Maybe this is part of unity, but it's also maybe so it's like everybody in the district community, everybody sort of on the same page, ah. we're all working together as a team toward these same shared goals. We generated a very nice list. There are boards that oftentimes get embroiled in internal conflict. Sometimes boards become polarized because human nature, we have different viewpoints, but it really is that diversity of a school board that is the strength of the school board. Unity. When you agree upon goals, you're agreeing about an action plan. Where is this district headed? How this really works for your favor in bringing unity for the board is that future decisions that you need to make. You can take a step back and think, how is that going to impact the goals that we have established? Is this decision helping us work towards that goal? Or are we going in the opposite direction? Goals help bring unity, and that's why it's so important that at the beginning of the school year, before it really unfolds, that's really when the goal setting process is undertaken. What I advocate is that we move away from the traditional mindset of goal setting. I mentioned the flavor of the year, meaning that there was really no rhyme or reason to the goal setting process. A lot of times boards did it because it was steep in tradition. They really didn't use anything except for their own internal feelings about the improvements that needed to be made within the district. But we don't live in that era that was about 15 years ago. Today, we live in an era of education reform, high state assessments accountability. The decisions that boards make at the top help drive improvement efforts. And one of the things that I'm a big advocate for is that when you're making decisions, what are you basing them on? And one of the things that really I bring to the table is that it's the data. The old saying is we, we are data rich, but information poor. I almost think that today, that's no longer the case. You have individuals within the district that can help you make sense of that data. And I'm going to talk about that as we get a little bit further down the road. So I really like this list that we came up with. Use this clicker. I love this phrase. And it's sort of the mantra of effective leadership, that they live their lives backwards. In the sense that if you think about an artist, they start with this vision of a masterpiece within their head, and then every brush stroke, every palette of paint leads them one step closer to accomplish that masterpiece. That's essentially leadership at the top. S staying forward focused, thinking in about 5, 10, 15, 20 years, where is this district going to be? What is this district going to be like? Because as school board members, collectively, you have the power through the goal setting process to put in place the mechanisms that will reach you towards that ideal future. Goals, really, if you think about them, they're nothing more than statements of purpose. But when we talk about goals at the board level, we're talking a little bit more than just statements of purpose. We're talking about goals that can be observed, observable, that can be measured. And so when you're setting the goal setting process, one of the things you need to keep in the back of your mind is 
how are we going to measure? What are the benchmarks that we're going to establish that are going to help lead us to fulfilling that goal? Sometimes goals might take about two, three, I would say maximum five years out. Maximum five years out. We want to think strategically. We want to plan for the future. So we said, really, goals are the mechanism for carrying out the board's work. A lot of people nowadays point their fingers at school boards and say, you know what, this is an outdated sort of uh, governance model. School boards are not effective, but there's been plenty of research to prove otherwise. One of the most famous ones is the Lighthouse Study. Is anybody familiar with that study, the Lighthouse Study? It was undertaken roughly in about the year 2000. And what they really, it was the first of its kind, and they wanted to find out, is there a correlation between the work of the school board and student achievement? One of the things that they found is that in high achieving districts, there were common characteristics amongst them. One of them was the notion that, you know what, students that walk through this door, they might have some baggage with them, but every student can learn. And it's our job to figure out how to best teach them. But they also collaboratively set their goals. They monitor their goals. They use data to help drive those improvement areas. It also helps you respond to changes that are happening. Love it or hate it, Common Core is here. We knew it was coming about. Goal setting helps you prepare for those types of things. We live in an era of diminishing resources. Mr. Noel shared with me that you know, you are, you're a fortunate district in the sense that you've been fairly isolated from the economic challenges that have really wreaked havoc on a lot of districts. I'm sure that, you know, I don't want to downplay it because I'm sure that you have your own challenges as well. Goals help you wade through those challenges and help you sort of uh, tie the stem. So I just want to go over a little bit of terminology because a lot of times mission and vision, they're used synonymously. And I'm going to come back to this a little bit later in the presentation. A mission statement really describes the purpose for the existence of the school district. What does it do for the individuals that come here? What does it do for the community? On the flip side of that, and you're not, you're not legally required to have a vision statement, but I've been talking already a, a, a lot about being forward focused. A vision statement is a collective statement about the ideal tomorrow. The ideal tomorrow that through the goal setting process you can work towards achieving. And I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. But we also have other things as well. A lot of districts will have core values. And really you're just looking at the, uh, the principles, the foundation of your educational system. A lot of districts uh, you have them as priorities, but a lot of them will have beliefs. What do they believe is the responsibility of the district in carrying out its mission? Okay, the most common one out there is all students can learn. But what does that actually mean? All students can learn. I mentioned this before, so I won't get too far into this, but a lot of times school boards, when they don't really have a clear understanding for why they exist in the sense of the district itself, what its purpose is, and they really don't have an idea of the future. In the goal setting process, they try to create random acts of improvement where they'll say, oh, you know what, here's an area where I think, you know, we kind of got to focus some attention on. Oh, here's another area over here that I think that, you know, we should also, uh, you know, work towards. And really all you're doing is kind of spinning your wheels. You're really not progressing. And I talked about the importance of the, of the mission and the vision because once you have a solid understanding of your mission, of your vision. You can create goals that are aligned to it. So really we're talking about establishing a structure for establishing goals. And part of that structure is founded in your mission and vision because goals help you fulfill your mission and work towards that vision. Now does anybody know when your mission and vision statement was drafted? You know when that came into existence? In the 90s. Probably in the 90s. Both of these statements have shelf lives, just so we are aware. 
And one of the things that I'm going to advocate in, the, in a minute here is that when you begin your goal setting process, you begin with your mission and vision. You might find out that they're just nothing more than a statement. It doesn't hold any meaning. And you may decide, you know what, that might be an initiative that we want to undertake. But the mission and vision help establish the structure for which you are setting your goals. I'm going to come back to that. So a little bit of responsibilities of a school board. Some of this we already mentioned, like setting direction. But you also establish a structure. I'm sorry, Jeff, I've got to ask. Absolutely. You, you hit uh, responsibility. Is there a certain area that school boards aren't responsible for and the administration is? Uh, you got to be a little bit clearer. Well, you know, like uh, we have uh, a five-year building plan, which it, we meet regularly on that. We, we discuss that a lot. But what about, you know, with students? Do we, uh, really, the, the line in the sand, All right. if you want to just really have it clear cut, is the superintendent is responsible for the everyday operations of the district. So that would include the you know, disciplining of students. It would be uh, you know, teachers. It would be the administrators as well. At the board level, we, we recommend that you stay at that 30,000 foot level. That really you're looking at the big picture. And that the decisions that really drive your conversations are really what's best for the entire district as a whole. Um, it's really policy setting. And it's also things like goal setting. Does that kind of make sense? Yep. Yeah. All right, perfect. I want to make sure that I answered your question there. So when I also talk about a structure is that if you're setting goals, you really need to commit to that. And part of that is by ensuring in the budgeting process that resources are allocated for the superintendent to carry out those goals. And the goals that you draft really need to be realistic. I'm just going to create a wild scenario. If, for example, New Hartford had an 80% graduation rate, and as a board you say that it's unacceptable. An unrealistic goal would be to tell the superintendent, we want that graduation rate to be 99% in one year. That's a very ambitious goal. And really, what's causing that 20% that of individuals to not graduate? As a board, you need to dig into that. And that's really where the data comes into play, is understanding why maybe that 20% is not. Because then you can start focusing those goals at a more granular level, level to start pinpointing areas that will improve your big overarching goal. And we'll, we'll come back to that. Support, that is huge. As a board, you not only set the goals, but you need to support your superintendent as well. And that's through monitoring, that's through making the adjustments, that's through having the conversations. This is a collaborative effort between both entities. And if a goal is not progressing the way that you envisioned it, a lot of boards fall into the trap of pointing fingers. They fall into the trap of the blame game. And, and I really recommend that we try to steer clear of the, of the blame game and take a look at the whole. Why is this not happening? Is there something the board can be doing? Is there something the superintendent can be doing? And that's where those informal conversations at that mid-year are very crucial. Accountable, and we have just touched upon it, is that as a board collectively, we are accountable for our actions, and if we're setting goals, we need to be accountable for them if they succeed. If they're not succeeding, there's nothing wrong in realizing that if I set a goal and it's almost impossible to reach that goal, to shift course. Leadership. You are the leaders of this district. You are at the top of the leaders within the community of this district. And as such, you need to report periodically how you are progressing towards those goals. So the process that really I advocate, and that we advocate, I should say, really involves five major steps. The first one is reaffirming or clarifying your district's mission or vision. I just worked with the school district not too long ago, and I was doing roles and responsibilities as they had some board turnover. And I, I started talking about the importance of the mission and vision. The superintendent, and it kind of, it was a little bit of a curveball, said, yeah, 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 you know what, well, we have one of those. We don't need to spend time on this. So, you know, I just kind of threw out one of those blanket statements. So, well, okay, imagine if you're a board member and you're approached by somebody within the community. 
Now, I'm not asking that you, you yours is fairly lengthy, to be able to recite your vision and mission, but at least you should be able to tell them what it encompasses, and hopefully you can tell them what has the district done in order to fulfill its mission and vision, and that's really where the importance. For me, because I don't live in New Hartford and I'm not part of this board, when I read your vision and mission statement, it really didn't have any meaning for me. But as a school board, that's where it has the meaning. To be able to articulate it to the community and say, here's what we are doing in order to fulfill that mission and work towards that vision. And I might sound a little bit like a broken record here to a certain degree, but that's really where the goals uh, more or less kind of fall in place. Performing a needs assessment, and that's really where we can pull the data in. Setting goals and an action plan comes from the superintendent. Implementing those goals and supporting them, monitoring them, and adjusting. This becomes a cycle. It's a cycle for improvement. All too often, and I'm glad to hear this is not the case with your board, boards will set goals, we're done, we're out of here. I, I usually like asking, so how'd you guys do towards your goal? And you kind of get this look down and looking up to the sky, and, and nobody really wants to look you in the face because they really don't have an answer. I don't think that that's the case here, but I think that we're looking for a process to maybe make it a little bit easier of pinpointing the areas that definitely need improvement. Goals versus objectives. Here's another area that often is used synonymously, and, and they're not. The board's job is to set goals. They're general. They're often intangible. They're generally broad goals. They're abstract. But they're also strategic. And I'll show you some examples as we come down the road here. But one of the things that you'll do is that you'll find areas a goal area. It could be student achievement. That's a goal area that you as a board determine, you know what, like, here's an area in the district that needs improvement. You can then boil it down to start pinpointing something a little bit more specific. It's really where the objectives come into place, and that's really where the superintendent comes in. And that's more or less the superintendent's domain. Objectives now become specific. They become measurable. They're concrete, they're tactical. So as I used the example before, you have an overarching goal of student achievement. You realize that in the district you have 80% graduation rate, that does not sit well with you. You then decide that this needs to become a priority. We need to address this. So you set that goal area. And then maybe you boil it down to be a little bit more specific to have it in tune with graduation. Superintendent's job is not to take a look at the data to disaggregate it, to pinpoint it down, to say here are the areas that we can plant a seed of improvement through the goal setting process, and hopefully if we do this, we're gonna see increased, uh, increased graduation rate. Maybe you notice that a certain segment of the population is often absent from school, and that's an indicator that they may not graduate. Maybe you look back and you say, you know what, third grade reading proficiency isn't where it needs to be. And third grade reading proficiency is often tied to success later on in high school. And if they're not up to par at third grade, that could mean by the time they get into high school, they might be falling behind. And that's where the objectives come into place. And really, it's the superintendent's job to find those, to bring them to the board, and then to have an agreement about that. Question for you. Absolutely. If we're not setting goals that are measurable and those are the objectives how do we measure how we're doing then well they are measurable. you're going to talk about graduation rates for example you can know that's a clear measurement and there's leading you know lagging indicators that you could actually say um you know here are areas for example you know if you know uh, student attendance is problematic that's something that you could ask for reports about you know how are we how are we faring on attendance maybe at the board level you decide and take a look at your policy for attendance and realize that it's a little bit too lax at the board, but that's part of your job, is to say, hey, we can change the policy about attendance to make it a little bit more strict so we can uh, improve that. So they're, if know, I understand, they're more overriding, like broader measurable goals, and then the objectives and how you get there. Are the objectives really become the measurable, measurable 
piece. If you want to improve student achievement and that's your overarching goal, it's really your objectives that will tell you how you're progressing towards impact and student achievement. Yes. I feel like you, I'm sorry. I feel like um, you said two conflicting things. You said that it was the superintendent's job to, to disaggregate data and determine what is either an indicator or what might be something using the analogy of the graduation rates. Those are the things that, that they need to be looking at. And then you also said that it's the board's role to disaggregate data and look into that data and said there is a support to do that. So which is it? I'm sorry, I might have misspoken. I do apologize for that. All I simply was trying to say is that the superintendent would then take that disaggregated information to the board to have that conversation. But there are other individuals other than the super. I just kind of put that in the context of an example. But there are other individuals like your business official that could come and present that data and help disaggregate it. Does that make sense? I guess what I'm trying to establish is it's the board's role to set a general goal and turn that over to whomever that's responsible for. And then they would report back to us on more specificity Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to focus that in a little bit more as I progress through this. So if, if there's something is still kind of unclear performance. Okay. Hopefully I'll, I'll address that. I, I apologize for that. I tried to put it in the context of an example and it did cause a little confusion and I see that now. Absolutely. So types of goals. And, and I've seen boards that really mix these up. You, there are board goals and some school boards will intertwine them with district goals. And if you're setting board goals and really what Board goals are as you're looking at your operations as a whole, looking for ways to improve, and then setting goals to work towards those improvements. Oftentimes, boards will conduct a self assessment on an annual basis to determine where specifically are those areas of improvement. But there's also superintendent goals, and superintendent goals are then tied into the superintendent evaluation, which legally you are required to do on an annual basis. And so one of the thing about superintendent goals is they're often performance based. And really part of the goals stem from the contractual language that is in the superintendent's contract, but it also comes from the district goals themselves. And so if you're looking, well, how do we measure if the superintendent is progressing towards them? That's really where a rubric comes into place. And that needs to be a fluid conversation between the board and the superintendent to determine here is the goal that we are working at, here is the rubric upon which we are going to assess how you are progressing towards those goals. And, and John, I did provide for you, um, there is a copy from the ASA. If you go into the back of that, I just gave one to you, I don't know if it was necessary to do it. I, I give some examples of some of the language that you can incorporate into a performance type rubric. And so really, when you look at it, board goals, are then non-subjective in the sense that if you're just using a Likert scale, one to five, how did the superintendent do? Well, you know, I really hate that superintendent too. The rubric steps away from that, and it really looks at the performance of the superintendent. So, uh, if you got questions about that, I'll definitely uh, help you out. And those are, and they said those are those are more or less tied to district goals. Yes, they are. District goals are superintendent goals. But there are other ones as well. So really, what I'm advocating here is that the rubric itself gives you a way to measure that and determine how they're progressing. So some of the guiding questions that you really want to think about when undertaking the goal setting process is really, where are we now? What data is going to help us determine the current state of the district? Where do we want to be in the future? So really, we're establishing a baseline and then we're looking how far out we want to measure that. How are we going to get there? So this takes the long range planning and the goal setting. So if you set a goal, it doesn't have to be for one year. It could be a three year out deal and then every year at the goal setting process, you come back and you evaluate how you progress towards it. And then you can kind of change the objectives. It needs to be, you can extend those goals out. How are we progressing? And that comes into the monitoring. I'm going to advocate that we begin this process that I mean, we're not going to do it now, but I do have it at the end is that you take a look at your vision and mission. I said they kind of have a shelf life. They need to have meaning not only to you, but to the community at large. And that it provides that structure. Typically we say 10 years for a vision statement is probably time to get a new one. Unless you really read it and say, you know what, this really speaks to us. 
And this is really a great idea of where we need to be in the future. And I'll provide an example. Also, by going over your mission and vision and kind of defining it, it really helps orient new members. It helps bring them on the same page. And as you go through the year and you're making those decisions, you can not only determine if it's in the best interest of the goals you set, but is it in tune with your mission and your vision as well. The needs assessment. Here's the meat and bones. This is really, really where goal setting comes into play. It's good to know about your district. A needs assessment is going to help you understand your district a mile wide and a mile deep. It's really digging into that data to have the data brought to you, to have somebody help disaggregate that data so you can start pinpointing areas that need improvement. Really, you're creating a snapshot of the district. That's gonna help you establish sort of that baseline. Here we are, here's where we want to be. Now we're gonna put a goal into place, we're gonna have benchmarks so we can measure using uh, you know, whatever agreed upon indicators that, uh, that you discuss. And that will tell you whether or not you're progressing towards those. Data-driven decision-making. At the top, we're advocating that our teachers understand their students. That they use the data to help determine how to best present material to them. How are my students learning? Where are the individual students floundering? There are a lot of different software out there, the NWEA, Northwestern, something assessment. I always forget that E. I don't know if your district has this or something similar to it, but essentially what this is, it's a testing program. My daughter, who's uh, now going into second grade, has done this. They sit down at a computer, when they get questions right, they become more challenging. When you get them wrong, they become less challenging. And it gives you automatic feedback in terms of how that individual did on that assessment. I'm sorry, that's star? star. Okay, yes, and that's another big one. And that's a great way to get leading indicators. Before I wait until the end of the year, maybe when they take a final assessment to say, oh, you know what, this person could need help way back then. That type of data is very helpful. So what are the types of data that we should be looking at when we perform a needs assessment? One, we definitely want to look at achievement data. I understand that every year, and most you know, school boards have this, is you're looking at your state report card, you're looking at how you are doing not only as a district, but in similar districts around the state. That's, a, that's one area in which you can use to help pinpoint needs of this district. But you want to also use demographic data as well, not only with the individuals that go to the school, but the community at large. Look at program data. What are the programs that we are offering? How effective are those programs? I remember my, my final year of teaching, they were still offering it, and it got cut right after I, I had left. Psychology. How many kids enrolled in that? Two. The board said, we cannot fund a program in which only two kids enrolled. So they had the two kids complete it, and after that, they chopped it. The data helps drive tough decisions. Perception data. How does the community look at the school? How do the kids look at this school? My first teaching job, the kids, I mean, it wasn't a fantastic building, but I thought, you know, a lot of kids, they were great kids. The kids were down on the district. There wasn't a whole lot of spirit there. They laughed at the building. They thought other school districts laughed at them. In my opinion, that's something the board should be aware of. Because that's an area that if you determine is critical because your thoughts and feelings about your school often are tied to achievement. You could say, well, hey, we want to improve student achievement. Kids are really down about their district. They don't feel good about it. What can we as a board do to improve that and hopefully impact student achievement? How do you make that more tangible? I mean, that's kind of a feeling and hearsay sometimes where you might have a couple students it talking is. down. But so how do that's you measure gonna be that? One that's how, gonna how be do a, districts measure that? That's going to be a tough measure. Said it's going to be a tough measure, and it really is going to take you know some time for somebody to sit back and say, well, okay, how do we measure that? You could look at participation rate in sports. Um, that could be one area of a measurable. Um, attendance at sport, uh, sporting events, uh, dances, anything of, of that nature where sort of school pride is, is celebrated. So it does take a little bit of thinking outside the box, 
but there are ways to measure. So when we talk about a needs assessment, we're really talking about an environmental scan, where there's two things you really kind of want to take a look at. What are the external forces outside of this district that really we have no control over that is going to impact this district, perhaps in a negative or a positive way? You might look at maybe demographic in, uh, information, maybe economic indicators. There are districts in which they're experiencing property values just plummeting. And that's an indicator that something's happening and that we need to start planning for the future. Trends and events, and I'll give you one, the uh, property tax freeze, that they're still working out all the kinks and all the details. As a board, we should be sort of uh, understanding how that's gonna impact the funding of this school because again, that's gonna help with the long range planning and oftentimes your business official, if you invite them in, and, they, and a lot of districts will do this anyway, will give maybe a three or five year projection of where they believe the district to be within that time span. And that information is critical within the goal setting process as well, because it helps plan for that. They also want to look internally. And I guess some examples, maybe technology. You, know, you might want to look at your technology plan. Is there sufficient technology here? Is it outdated? Maybe your staffing. Maybe you want to change the way you're hiring. You really want to attract really high caliber, high caliber teacher, high caliber teachers. <laughs> what resources do you have that are readily available? And again, a lot of districts will perform this. Now, do you guys do a SWOT analysis when you sit down for the goal setting process? I do offer this as a suggestion. A lot of districts will do this or a variation of it. And the SWOT analysis is great, and I did provide an example for you within uh, your folder if you'd like to take out that sheet that has the four quadrants on it. And essentially, here's a way for a board to kind of brainstorm, to have these sort of outside entities like your business official, like your superintendent, or other individuals to help provide feedback. And here's where you can think about what are the strengths of our district. And when you think about strengths, you want to think about things that can be replicated throughout. Oftentimes, because of these tough financial times, tough decisions do need to be made. But by pinpointing what your strengths are and the things that you don't want to lose, goal setting oftentimes will help you retain those. So it's important that you know what the strengths of the district are. But in the same degree, what are your weaknesses? Where do they lie? What are the opportunities that exist for this district? Are there things that we could be taking advantage of that would be beneficial for the students? What are the threats that are maybe current or on the horizon that are going to impact this district negatively? And as I mentioned before, that when you're setting goals, you need to be cognizant of that. Because you can't set a goal and then realize that, uh-oh, you know what? We have X, Y, and Z barriers in our way that we didn't think about that's going to prevent us from reaching that goal. And by understanding your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, you can develop a plan that will help weave through those barriers and hopefully allow you to achieve those goals. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. This is very, I mean, very, um, you know, a total sort of look at our whole district, you know, mm -hmm. you know and it's something that, um, if I'm listening to you talk, it's not <laughs> something that we're gonna, okay, at the end of the day, five o'clock, we're gonna be done. You know, it's very, you know, it's, you're looking at all the stakeholders. It sort of reminds me a little bit of when we took a look at our, like, long range, you know, um, plan where you have all these people. It's like a half a year process to do it. Do these boards do this in a summer? Is it something that we would do now and spend, like, I'm thinking about this, a year gathering all this information, talking to stakeholders, talking to students, talking to parents, and then putting together, like, like we do, like, a five-year plan, a ten-year plan. I mean, is that... I mean, how does that work? You know what I mean? This is very all-encompassing. It is very all-encompassing. And really what I'm offering, or offering you are, are the best practices. And to take the suggestions that I'm giving you and then to sit down as a board and say, here are the things that I really liked about the goal-setting process that Jamie went over with us. I think that we should incorporate this into our process. And as a board, you agree about what are those elements. A lot of boards will have a workshop. 
in which all they're doing is sitting down. It's an open meeting. The public is more than welcome to come. And all they're doing is they're going to start off with their vision and mission statement. They're going to have a discussion about that. What does it mean to them? How has the district fulfilled that? What are the, the programs or incentives that, that were put into place? Once they've done that and, and sort of everybody is on the same level, that's where they jump into the needs assessment. Goal setting, and this is funny, that it relates to this a little bit, not so funny. I had a board where they spent two hours doing district goals. And the board president, I heard the superintendent, by the way, the board president came out, I'm so proud of him, and, and the rest of them, oh, it took us two hours, we got it done, yes. And the superintendent literally couldn't hold back and started laughing and said, two hours, really? That's barely enough time. The process does get easier after you've done it initially. Because once you've set your goals, and the first part of it's tough because you really are, you're trying to pull in all sources of data that you can to give you a realistic picture of, of, of the district itself. But as you progress through the year and you go through that cycle in which you're having those reports coming to you, that data becomes fresh on your mind. And so by the time that you revisit your goals for the next year and you're ready to either uh, reaffirm those goals or maybe move in a different direction, it does become easier. Because I know like, um, you know, when we were, before Bob was hired as superintendent, we were looking for a superintendent, we had a lot of these focus groups getting mm -hmm. together where people talked about, the, you know, parents, whatever, came together and talked about the strengths of the district, weakness of the district. And for me, I don't think anybody was here on the board when that happened, but for me, that was the most enlightening thing because you sort of had parents um, talk about just in a general free atmosphere on, gee, you know, the athletic program, like, oh, da, 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 or, you know, this, this, just sort of like, and it's sort of, like you said, it gave you a picture of what everybody else sort of thinks of the district. Absolutely. And there's different ways you can go about gathering that information. That, you know, technology is so common nowadays. A lot of districts will use SurveyMonkey. And they'll just kind of send it out to internal staff and you know community members, and that's the way that they do it. Other districts will do a full blown strategic plan in which they hire an outside entity to come in. That person basically spearheads the movement to bring in all the various stakeholders to get their input, to draft the mission statement, to draft the vision statement, to take all that data and boil it down and really create a strategic plan for school improvement. And give you a prime example of, of a district that very successfully did that is Horseheads, which is, I guess it's kind of a distance from here, but it, you know, it was a district that was not performing to the caliber that they wanted to. And so there are different ways to do it. And if you were to go down that road, you know, I can definitely offer some suggestions. But it's a little overwhelming when you think about the data because they, there's so much out there. Yeah, it's, it's, the good news is, I mean, we've got the achievement, we've got it all. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, we, we've seen it all in, in kind of pieces, you know, but we, there's ways to get the demographic data of the school. Uh, that's all out there, too, done by the state. Uh, the achievement data, obviously, we've all seen. Uh, program data, I mean, we saw that in, in staffing and curriculum, so, I mean, it's all there. Perception data, that's a, that's a little bit different deal. But, but what Lisa was talking about, and that wasn't done that long ago, it's not that data. I mean, dated. We had that data, do we not, from... Well, how long ago <laughs> was that? Seven years ago? Seven yeah. years ago. It's dated. <laughs> Even if it was three years ago, I probably would have said it, it's dated. Education is a rapidly evolving a whole, entity. Of, a whole new generation of parents. Of parents Absolutely. Right. And it's a really good way, I mean, if you think about it, because community members want to have a voice within the district. And, and this gives them an opportunity to do so. And once they feel like they're part of the process, they're a little bit more apt to help support the goals and, and which are and that's one of the things that really I advocate is that when you go through this process and you're thinking systemically, how is this going to be pushed through the entire system? You know, when, when I was a teacher, and I hate to keep going back on this, but I'm using my personal experience here. I remember the first day, you know, we're all sitting there and you know, the superintendent gets up and the superintendent welcomes everybody back and says, oh, by the way, the district goals are, and then that was all you heard. I mean, I don't know if really that's the appropriate avenue for getting people on board for implementing those goals collaboratively. And so I kind of throw it up to you to think, well, what is the best method for getting sort of everybody on board to support those goals and think about one for them? Before we get started in setting goals for the next year, we look at last year's goals. Some might have been too, achievable, too easily achievable. Some might have been impossible to achieve. Some might have been, okay, we can improve on that. 
yes. a starting point and maybe eliminate some and then add some, or is it just start out with the gold? That's a conversation that you're going to want to have. And I would definitely recommend you look at your previous gold because if you wait through those, that I guarantee there's going to be some that you're going to say, you know what, that's really an area of high priority within the district and that we need to continue this path. And others, you're going to say, this is a little bit too far into the weeds for us. This isn't really where we should be going as a board. That's really more of the superintendent's domain. I will say that it is in this, that when you formulate your goals, five maximum. Mm -hmm. Now you can have multiple objectives in which you're gonna reach that, but if you're creating, and a lot of districts will do that, and a lot of boards will do this, yeah, we hammered out 20 goals for this year, look how awesome we did. Well, in essence, what are you doing? You're really spreading your resources very thin and trying to, to realize those. And so what I'm advocating here is that the data is going to help reveal to you what are the highest priorities of this district. Where is the areas that we are not performing that needs attention? And that's really where you as a board decide here is where we need to support this to improve that specific area. Does that make sense? Let me ask you a follow-up. Sure. When you have a district that is high performing, how, I think the areas that you focus on that are not as well performing are very micro as opposed to macro. Um, does that, if you have five goals that are focused on these low performing areas that, yeah, I think are very small subsets of subsets, how do you keep those goals overarching and how do you make it so that it, it seems like how come they're ignoring this and just focusing on that when it's because we're okay here, but let's focus on that. And that's really where, it, you know, and I hate sounding like a broken record, but when you are addressing the public and they are questioning you, why are you focusing your efforts here and not here? Well, you can then tell them, well, when looking at the data, this is really the area that is the highest priority at the moment. It doesn't mean that at some point in the near future we, we're going to address this, but right now, given the resources that we currently have, here's where we need to funnel our efforts into do have a district that is you know, high performing like the district here, there is always areas for improvement. And so for example, if you're looking at, you know, I always hate to say this, but one of the groups of students that are most commonly overlooked within a school district, anybody know what group they are? Middle. Yeah. Oftentimes those are the kids that are overlooked because the high performing students, they're doing great. And you want to support them with honors classes and whatever you can and then the kids down at the bottom we know that they need those supports and so we follow the efforts in there and so at a high performing district you might say you know what we really have not paid much attention to the kids in the middle and I, I, I hear that a lot yes and so as a board you might and the data might reveal that here's an area where you know what some of these kids in the middle don't belong in the middle oh man, I, was one of those kids. <laughs> I was a slacker in school you know, life kicked me in the butt a few times and I got my stuff together. But, uh, you, you know, that's really where, you know, that, that's where the conversations happen around the table. And that's where you start looking and not just saying, you know, because I think that one of the traps that some high performing school districts fall into is that we're doing great. Look at our assessments. We really don't have any areas of improvement. If they were to dig in deeper, I, I guarantee they would, that they would find areas. But would you have like an overriding goal like, Increase student performance. Okay, this is sort of like a general goal. Yep, that's a general and then goal area. Would you have maybe, like what Beth was saying, maybe you have five objectives, and maybe you mm -hmm. know this year you're going to look at, you know, these are the three. You're just going to focus on these three little things, and maybe next year something like that. Is that what you would say? Like for example, like focus on the B student. Or we had a, we had a goal. We found that the transition from sixth grade to seventh grade, we're a sixth grade elementary school to seventh grade middle school, the mm -hmm. transition was very difficult. So we did a whole study on how to make that transition. So that, again, that's student improvement. Absolutely. So that's, you know, that's sort of a more of an objective under that overriding increased student performance, right? Absolutely. Okay. And you're honestly 100% correct. You know, one district that I work with, and uh, most districts would agree, I don't know where ninth grade falls for you. Middle, um, middle school. But it's still in middle school. And, and that's a smart move. Um, if, if you've decided, and the reason why I say that is because that is one of the biggest transitions for adolescents is making that leap to the high school at ninth grade. And a lot of districts, through their goal setting process, have said we need to support these to ensure that they're not going to fall through the cracks, that we give them the support so they are going to succeed and put those measures into place. 
And so I'll give you some examples as we move a little bit further down the road. You can kind of give you a flavor of, you know, how you might do your goal set. But just, but just to, to carry on to, to, to Lisa's, you know, question here. So if I'm getting this right, mm -hmm. the district sets a, a very broad goal, increase student performance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the objectives go to the superintendent and well, to They're going to be work collaboratively. Collaboratively. Yes. Collaboratively. So here's what we're going to do. Bing, 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 bing. Mm -hmm. A measurement of that could be uh, an overall GPA percentage. Could be yes. Or something along those lines. So if the objectives are there and then some performance measure that is tangible mm -hmm. is, is set. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And I'll show you as we get a little bit deeper some examples of um, you know, kind of what I'm talking about. So really, you know, the SWOT analysis is a very systematic method for determining where you might want to create your goals and goal areas. So for example, say we have done our needs assessment. We've compiled a lot of the data. The next step of the process here is that you want to think, well, out of the data that we have collected, and I'm using this as an example because if we're going to sort of revamp our goal setting process, this might be where you want to start. Take a look at all the things that you have generated, and you want to think, what are some categories? What are some broad goal categories that we, uh, that we could create? One, you know, could be student achievement. Another area could be curriculum and instruction. And then what you want to start doing is you want to start placing the information that you generated on your SWOT analysis. And you want to plug them into those categories, those goal categories that you've created. So for example, student achievement. You have, you know, you have an 82% graduation rate, which obviously you do not. 34% of all students met proficiency on the ELA, only 9% exceeded proficiency. Then on the flip side, curriculum instruction. Maybe at the board you realize that, you know what, curriculum lacks rigor within the district. Maybe you realize that your core curriculums are not aligned to the state standards. From what you do there is then you start looking at each one of those categories of information. You start determining and you can place them in a number of priority. You can say, for example, student achievement. Our number one top priority in there is our graduation rate. That needs to be addressed. That becomes your main focus. You can say secondary to that is the proficiency levels. You do that for each one of your categories that you've generated. You then look at your priorities, and as a board, you then determine what are the areas that need the most attention. Because then what you do is you take that and you turn them into your goals. And I'll show you in just a second here. I already mentioned that you really don't want to create more than two to five goals and trying to have sort of action steps and objectives to reach that. But really, your overarching goals, you don't want to spread yourselves too thin. You also want to think that if this is long range planning, we need to think about this strategically. And maybe we do want to improve student achievement and we realize you know, our highest priority right now is graduation rate. The secondary to that is the proficiency levels. And so in year one, we're gonna focus our efforts on increasing the graduation rate. Maybe year two, that's where we switch and we start focusing in on the proficiency levels and thinking how can we improve that because that's working towards your overarching goal of improving student achievement. Uh, I kind of already went over this, so I'm just going to kind of uh, skip over this. But we also said that goals need to be measurable. I think that we kind of grasp this concept that when you're creating your goals, you also want to think what are the benchmarks that we're going to establish? How are we going to measure that? And that's really a conversation between you, the superintendent, and whoever else that you bring into this mix. You also want to think how often do we want this reported? And so again, if you decide that a district a school board calendar in which we place agenda items for the future on works. You can then plug in the dates that you're going to have these presentations and by whom. When setting goals, do you guys use the SMART method? SMART is an acronym. They're specific, they're measurable, they're attainable, they're relevant, they're time bound, which can be a little confusing because we don't apply this to the overarching goal area. I just want to be clear on that. I'll show you that. So our goal setting framework, here is essentially a snapshot of kind of what a lot of districts have done. You have your vision, the ideal future, you have your mission, what is the purpose of this district, why does it exist, you then have established your goal areas through your needs assessment, you then can create 
smart goals that are going to reach towards that goal area and then you have your objectives and really the superintendent is the person that really helps advise what are the best ways in which to achieve it. So here is an example of a goal setting process. We have at the top the Lang District will be an exemplary 21st century learning community whose graduates are prepared to excel in a complex, interconnected, changing world. Oftentimes people think that vision statements need to be paragraphs and very elaborate. They don't have to be. They can be as short as this. Mission. It's a statement. It's a statement. Exactly. Your ideal future. Think that's <laughs> right. <laughs> Mission to inspire all students to pursue their dreams and to contribute and thrive in a diverse community. They then perform the needs assessment. They realize that, you know what, we're going to create these categories. Student achievement, culture is a big one nowadays. A lot of districts are looking internally because of all of the events that have unfolded within the school districts and determining do we have a culture of bullying? positive culture is it a negative culture and districts that realize that uh oh we don't have such a great culture in the school that needs to become a priority because we don't want anything negative to happen to these students they need to be here and be positive to learn so what they decided is that all right we're going to have an overarching goal here here is our district goal it's going to be specific it's going to be measurable and it's our desired outcome the blank district will ensure all students are college and career ready upon graduation by providing a system of curriculum and instruction aligned with the common core and focused on the defined 21st century skills and standards of excellence. So again, it's still fairly broad. You're addressing student achievement. You've linked it to your vision because you want to prepare them for that diverse world that they're about to embark upon. You're also fulfilling your mission through this. Now comes the objectives. How are we going to improve upon that? And so an example could be, well, yes, sir, to interrupt you. Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. This, but goal areas. Is this a place where what Bob said about our standing committees? I mean, if we've got standing committees, are those goal areas? Standing committees are the workhorse of the board. Okay. And their job is to merely inform the board, okay. not make decisions for the board. Right. Now, if they come to you with uh, you know, a suggestion, you as a board discuss it, and then you vote upon it for action. Your committees are good in the sense that they will provide input into some of the goals that you would like to have established, but should they drive the goal setting process, my answer to that would be probably no. Okay. So it wouldn't be a goal area. Probably would Probably not be an goal okay. area. It would be a source of information. Okay. But those standing committees are made up of board members. They're not. Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, yes. But for example, let's say you took that one for example, and you said uh, uh, providing a system of a curriculum and instruction aligned with common core and based on mm -hmm. defined twenty first century skills. Okay. And okay. So for example, we this year we uh, or last year this year whatever we're going to have a new class in computer or skill computer. What's it called? Computer science, okay? So you could say the objective is investigate feasibility of offering a computer skills class at the high school. Wouldn't For the that, committee. Right, but that would be one of your objectives, that right? It could be an objective, yes. Objective, and that objective is assigned to staffing curriculum. Gotcha. Yes. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they're all interconnected. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So again, your objective then becomes aligning. And so as the board, if this were your objective, what do you think the board's responsibility would be to carry out that objective? Talk to the budget committee and make sure there's money for it. There you go. <laughs> if you're going to create that as one of your objectives and tie it to your goal, as the board, you're committing to this. And as such, you need to be wary that, hey, do we even have money to offer professional development? And to say, yes, we do, because in the budget process, we're going to ensure that we're going to put money aside so our teachers are trained to know how to implement the Common Core across the various subject levels. But I want to see data that shows where we stand right now and show, demonstrate with that professional development where do we go with it. Absolutely. And that's where the conversation of what indicators are we going to use to measure that comes into play. And so what I want to show you right now, and I'll kind of show you how this works to a certain degree. If you could do me the courtesy of taking out the Shenandoah um, goal sets. 
I offer this just merely as a model. Whether you like this or not is really entirely up to you, but I kind of like the way that they've outlined their goals. And so, um, oh, I forgot about this slide. I, I mentioned this before, but we're looking at a systemic approach. And that's really why I chose Shenanda Hall, because they very nicely have done that and shown it in their goal setting process of how we're going to pump this through the system. And if we take a look up here at the visual, and this is really the, the theory behind cascading goals, is the board sets the direction, they indicate the areas of high priority, they become the goals. The superintendent administrative goal, or their job there to focus those goals at a more granular level, level to create the action steps. Then it's passed down to the administrators and supervisors, their job is to see the implementation all the objectives and action steps, and oftentimes if it comes down into the classroom, the teachers are the ones that are going to be carrying out those objectives and action steps. How this all comes back to you as the board is the teachers then report progress to the administrators and supervisors, and they then report to the superintendent administrative cabinet, and then finally it comes to the board level so you can determine uh, how, this is, uh, how this is being pushed through the system itself. I just want to go back to a question because I think where we sometimes get are standing committees. Mm -hmm. So the standing committees wouldn't be at the admins, they wouldn't be overseeing the implementation. No. They would, no. So they would still be one step up. Because I think sometimes our committees get a little granular sometimes. Right? But if you're saying oh the, the administrative and supervisor overseeing the implementation of objectives and action steps, wouldn't like I'm just using staff and curriculum because I'm not familiar with that. Wouldn't like um, Alan report on report to the staff and curriculum committee? This is your goal. This is how we're doing in this goal. Wouldn't you report? To, uh, to well, that's why I'm, I'm not really sure where the standing yeah. committees fit in there. I just want to be sure. You know, my it, the standing committees are there again because they did the workforce of And realistically, where do they come to the goal setting process? They're there to provide you information and suggestions about. The, you know, the direction of this district, then that becomes a conversation. And policy. And, and policy, absolutely. Would they have minutes that they report out and yes. a single board meeting and the full board performed? Absolutely. And so really, if you're, if you're looking at the implementation of goals through the system, they're not necessarily part of it per se, right. although you would want reporting to come back to those committees. So if you do have a curriculum instruction committee, as some districts do, if you're setting goals that pertain to that area, you definitely want to keep that committee apprised of what's happening. And that can be done in various ways, whether they attend the meeting, in which information is shared about that. It could be a board member that serves on that committee, uh, reporting out to the, to the overall committee. So there are ways, but they're just pretty much there to be the workhorse. But you definitely want that information to flow to them. that Shenanda Hallway has kind of really outlined their goals. And if you take a look, I hate that word synergy, but they've used it. And if you think about cascading goals and what I just said about the process of driving goals throughout the system, this is a collaborative effort. In the sense that the board is setting the goals, but it's now being pushed through the system. If you want to realize your goals, you need to have everybody on board to understand where is the direction that you're heading, what is it that you are accomplishing? What is their role in the process? You want to steer clear of those flavor of the year goals. And what I mean by that is they're goals that are not really entrenched in anything specific. They're just kind of, well, you know what, I think uh, literacy should be our goal this year. And somebody says, why literacy? And the person says, well, I like to read, and I think all kids should be able to read. It's good enough for me. And they make that to be their goal. And then actually they change it. And driving home that point for the umpteen million times. That's where the data comes into play. You're going to hate that word by the end of this. 
So if you see here, this is how they kind of envision it stemming outward. You have the district goal, you then create your essential uh, objectives, you then have your program level, what are the outcomes there, and the individual and professional leadership goals. And here is a specific goal that they created for the 12-13 year school year. Their overarching goal was district instructional goal is to improve student achievement. So that's their, that's their goal area. Within that, they said, well, here is our essential objective. This is what we would like to accomplish, improve student achievement by completing the APP, APPR and implementing essential components. What are the program sort of outcomes that we're going to be looking for? Well, write and use the SLOs, the learning objectives for relevant courses, develop locally selected measures of achievement, establish inter-rated reliability through administrative training, leadership actions, how are we going to ensure this happens, individual professional leadership goals. They break it down even further. So again, we have our student achievement. So we have our instructional goal. We then have our objective. What are the outcomes that we intend to see? But then here is our evidence. How do we know that we are progressing towards that? Here are the indicators that they agreed upon that they're going to look at. They're gonna look at the K through 12 progress on outcomes, number of administration successfully completing each state, number or percentage of teachers ranking on composite heightened scores. So again, they're gonna use the APPR to determine how well their teachers are progressing. You have your SLO, student learning objectives, and that within itself is going to create those measures. Percentage of students with GPAs of 75 plus. Use of innovative curricular models with virtual field trips, video conferencing, etc. And that's easily trackable because if you want those, then it's obviously going to be a paper trail. Okay. So again, I mean that's that's fantastic. I like the way that they. I mean, if you like this model and it works for you, you, you know, you're more than welcome to take it and adapt it. But let me just show you another example. And if you could take out the Boston Spa one for me, um, I'll, I'll show you another example of what they've done. Yeah. Now, Boston Spa has done something a little bit differently, and if you like this, and again, it's really finding what works for your board, what you're comfortable with, and what you believe is going to help drive improvements within the school district. And if you look at the front, they have their mission and their vision. But one thing that I kind of admire about Boston Spa is they created nine graduation competencies that they say by the time a student leaves here and enters out, whether it be college or, uh, or their career, that here is what they should be proficient in. They've essentially used the competencies to create their goal areas. And notice, they don't have too many goals, but they have uh, you know, substantial uh, action steps. So their long, if you look, their core value, academic achievement. Here they have their long range goal. All students will graduate college and career ready and will demonstrate mastery in the nine graduation competencies. Again, they're pretty broad. But as we come down, we're gonna start focusing that goal in. Here is our priority. All students will reach proficiency upon entering middle school and high school. Here's how we're going to ensure that that happens. Action steps. In the year 2011 to 2012, eight things that they are going to do to realize that goal. So they're kind of putting in objectives and, uh, and measurements in the same yes. group. Yes. So they've done it slightly different than Shenanda Howard. And again, I wanted to show you an alternative model as there's all different ways of compiling these. Yeah, they've done all three in one group. But if you look at the ingredients, they're all the same. And they're tracking what they did year to year. Exactly. And so at the end of the 2011-2012 school year, they sat down and they revisited those eight action steps. And they determined how much progress they made towards them. If one of those, they, didn't, uh, they were not comfortable with the progress that they made, they then rolled it over to the next year and determined that this is an area that we still need focus on. But they didn't just leave it at that. They dug in deeper. And that deeper question is why? Why did we not reach it? They didn't use the blame game, 
but they started to dig in deeper and they said, oh, you know what, X, Y, and Z, I don't think was working. How can we change course? What support can we give? Do they need more resources? And I'll bring that back to the importance of periodically having that conversation with the superintendent to determine, are we providing you with the level of support and resources you need to carry out our district goals? For the superintendent, the same degree is a source of, uh, of for you as well to say, you know what, I could, uh, you know, I can give you more support, or I need some more support for you. It's a two-way street. It was. In I'm, that I'm familiar with uh, an additional, an additional column in between the outcomes and the essential objective, which is what's needed to get it done. Absolutely, yeah. and, and that's your action steps. What are we going to undertake to fulfill this? And the action steps, that's where, again, the superintendent, that's really the superintendent's domain. To come back to you and say, here is what you know we can do that I intend on doing in order to fulfill that conversation as the board, you all agree upon it, you finalize your goals, and that's your action plan, and that's going to help carry you into the future. You know what else is interesting? They have in here, we will sustain certain things. Absolutely. That be something we, oh, without question. Us. Yeah. And that's why I go back, if we think about when I talked earlier about understand, understanding what your strengths are. If you know that you have you know, a high proficiency rates, well, why? What are you doing that is working for your students that are allowing them to achieve? Because those are the programs you want to sustain. And oftentimes when it comes, uh, you know, those difficult choices and something has to be on the chopping block, that's where you revisit that data and say, you know what, we really don't want to lose this because it's so beneficial for our students. And some districts have, they created goal sets in order to keep things in hopes that they don't lose it. And again, you know, you, I don't want to overspeak because I, I don't know all the circumstances, but what I've been told is that you've been fairly you know, insulated from a lot of that, which is you know, a testament to this district and the financial management of the district. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm just going to kind of wrap this up, and I want you guys to get a little handle of this, and we'll see if we can start working towards fashioning out some goals. But again, implementing and supporting. Once you fashion the goals, your job is not done. It's just really kind of starting. You want to implement them. You want to support them as you see going through the process. You definitely want to monitor the progression if you need to make adjustments throughout the year. That's the importance of having the reporting coming back to you. Again, I offer you the suggestion of creating that calendar in which you can kind of plug in and follow those goals and know when you're going to be receiving those reports throughout the year. Some of the things that you definitely want to come back to, I spoke about leading indicators and lagging indicators. That most of us know, should say, I think that we're familiar with these. You know, leading indicator is just, you know, it's a prediction based upon the current data that we have. It allows you to change course if needs to be, where lagging indicators would be an example of a state assessment. You've taken it, it's done, you've looked at the data, you then determine what could we have done to maybe steer the ship clear, and based on that data, that helps drive improvement as well. So leading and lagging indicators are two sources of data that you're going to most likely want reported to you. Some of the things that I have up here, college enrollment, but not only that, a lot of times that's where boards will stop. Well, we had X amount of kids, you know, percentage of kids going to college. One of the things that you know, I, I learned is that, you know, orientation day, when you're standing there and you look to your left and you look to your right, and you realize that probably by the end of this year, this person won't be there and that person won't be there. As part of the board, not only for you know who's going to college, but who's staying. Because if they're not staying in college, that could be an indicator that maybe they weren't readily prepared. Therefore, maybe we need to change course here in the district. Or what about looking at if they have to take any remedial courses or how long it takes them to Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Because that's really one of the driving forces behind this reform that? movement. We've talked about that a lot. So, I mean, I, we can get the benchmark. We get it from like, And you get the data that you can get your hands on, you most likely won't get all of it. Right. But even, you know, a snapshot or a glimpse will help you determine, you know, do we need to shift course here? Is this something that really needs attention on? Absolutely.
Absolutely. Yeah, and, and the benchmark stuff for that is out there. We've seen some presentations on that. You know, information and precision. Yep. And like I said, you know, I, I don't know your thoughts or feelings on the Common Core. We're not here to debate that. Like it or you know, okay, it, it is here. You know, the idea behind it is it's a set of higher standards that they theorize will better prepare our students. And so if we're tracking that data over the course of the year, and now that we've implemented the Common Core, we're going to start seeing at the college level just how well this is all working out. I mean, I think you can about survey monkey, you know, we've always yes. talked about this about surveying, you know, recent grads or college mm -hmm. students, you know, like how, how, how did you feel equipped? Did you feel like you were prepared, et cetera, et cetera? Absolutely. And so if you are definitely, I mean, if you are going to venture down that road, that's what you would want to do. Sit down and determine yeah. what are the various stakeholder groups that we would like to survey to get feedback from. And that would be an area that I would say yes, it would probably be most likely for it. I can try facilities as well. That's what prompted us. STEM facility development. Right. Students want to go to college and the lack of appropriate science rooms. STEM is the um, buzzword, I guess, if you want to call it that in education, science, Steam. technology, oh, engineering, Steam. math. What is it? STEAM. It's arts. Oh, with art, yeah. Steam. Did you throw arts in there? Yeah. <laughs> I, I love it. I, my brother sucked up all the talent. He is <laughs> phenomenal. I, I, I draw a mean stick figure, but I look at my daughter. And again, you know, at the board level, we're focused on really one thing within the district, and that's student achievement. When I look at my daughter, she gravitates to the arts. She loves writing, she loves reading, she's very creative, and I, you know, it makes me take a step back and think about the school that she is going to be progressing through with such focus and attention on STEM. I'm glad to hear that you incorporate the arts because that's something that quite often gets over. So we come back to the, to the superintendent evaluation, and this is kind of where we're going to kind of wrap this up here. I mentioned before that when you are creating district goals, you're also creating superintendent goals. The best way that you can go about measuring that is to take your goals and then create a performance rubric based upon it. And what I mean by that is how are you going to measure whether or not the superintendent is reaching that? You know, for example, um, it could be a broad area, and I'm going to step outside the goal setting area for a minute, but maybe you say, you know, the superintendent uh, needs to be transparent, open, and communicate with faculty and staff and community. How do you measure that? That's kind of a tough thing to do. And so really when you have a rubric and you, you get the verbiage there and you define exactly what it means, that's going to give you a better understanding of whether or not your superintendent is working towards achieving that. Performance-based rubrics are a great way to go. I don't know, you know what your assessment looks like in the conversation for superintendent evaluation. It's you know, more ideal for you know, another retreat. But I, I would definitely take a step back and take a look at the instrument that you're using. Oftentimes, do they involve you in the creation of the instrument? We're working on it. You're working on it. OK, perfect. If you need some more you know, resources, I know NISCUS is in the process of revamping theirs. I don't know where they are in their process. Um, a lot of other states that have that you know, whole book of them. So if you are looking for some models of what other states are doing, you know, just let me know and I'll definitely hand some stuff off to you. So again, really what I provided to you is the systematic way of creating goals, monitoring the goals, but more importantly, driving improvement efforts within the school. In the beginning, I talked about the board's ability to impact student achievement. Goal setting is the way that you and it's by finding out what the district needs and then creating that to be a high priority and then funneling the resources to that area to drive those improvements. And districts that have really successfully done that have seen student achievement rates uh, vastly improve. So now, I wanna give you guys a little bit uh, of an opportunity here to kind of dig in and kind of wade through this and at least get you started on the process for establishing the goals. And we don't really need to have a full-blown, and this is really kind of a, another day for this, but I definitely wanted to put up your mission statement. And my understanding is that it probably was drafted sometime in the 90s, in 1999, somewhere along there. What I'm going to encourage you to do 
is that when you sit down and you have that conversation and, and you use the best practices that I've sort of provided to you today, to first sit down and determine how are we going to go about in this goal setting process. And I do highly suggest that you carve out a workshop day. It's open to the public, but there is no public comment session. You are talking specifically about goal setting, therefore, it, you know, we have to abide by the open meeting law. But it's also great to invite the community in for them to listen to the types of goals that you're thinking about setting. And again, it creates that transparency. So sit down, determine how you want to undertake the process. Incorporate some of the stuff that I use, tweak the stuff that I kind of you know, gave you. You really want to find something that works for you. And then you want to start undertaking the process. And where I suggest you start is by looking at that mission statement. To kind of read through it together, determine, is this mission statement still valid? It was created in 1990-something, and, and, and the world has greatly changed in that short amount of time. Do we need to draft a new mission statement? If we do, that's going to be a conversation for another day, because that, can, that, that is a process upon itself. The other thing that I'm going to encourage you to look at is your vision statement. And again, I did provide a copy for you. This is just segments of it that you wanted to put up there. You want to determine, is this still the vision collectively that we have for this district? By the way, just out of curiosity, who is the most senior member on the board? How many years do you have? 16 years. You got 16 years. Is impressive. So you might remember when this yeah, statement came into play. Absolutely. I, I think it's slightly been changed, hasn't it, Bob? Over the years, we've. I mean, yeah. And so, if you look around you, we got 16-year veteran members. Most of you probably were not here when that vision statement was drafted. And so you might want to think this. Oh, you were. I was teaching at the time. Oh, so okay, perfect. Oh, that's, oh, that's right. So I remember they had every building, five buildings, they had every building getting represented, community representatives. I went to the students. I remember the meetings, large yep. committees <laughs> trying to get this done. Did you see them? Admissions. Admissions. If you undertake the front, I mean, there's different ways of going about doing it, but a lot of districts, when they do this, it's full blown. It doesn't take a day, it doesn't take a week. A lot of times it's going to take about six in order to get this done. And, that, and that's a, a huge coordinated effort. I don't want to scare you because you know it can be done and that there are outside entities that you can bring in that, that will help spearhead this for you. But you know one of the good things that we touched upon uh, before, if you're looking to draft a new mission or a vision, is that you're reaching outside to the community, you're reaching inside to the various people, staff members, teachers, bus drivers, etc., and you're having input from them to really fashion out what does this community what does this board believe is the purpose of this district? What do we stand for? And they fashion out a mission statement that sort of encompasses everybody's collective thoughts. And the same goes with a vision statement in the sense of where does the community see this school in about five, 10 years down the road? And it really helps clarity in terms of what does the community, what do the staff deem important? And I talked about creating that structure for creating goals because your goals are tied to your mission and your vision because it allows you to carry out your mission and reach that vision statement. And so at some point, you, you're going to definitely want to revisit this. And I, I recommend you start right off the bat with it. This is a great conversation to have. Not only to just kind of hammer out if you decide that you want to draft new statements, but it's a great conversation for the board to have collectively because you get to listen to one another, their thoughts, their, percep their perceptions. And oftentimes, you're going to determine you know, are we all on the same page? And if you collectively have an idea of the direction that you're working for in the future, that helps bring that unity to the board. And when you have those tough decisions in front of you, you kind of want to think about the direction that the district is heading in and determine whether or not those decisions that you're about to make are going to be in tune with that. And it's a great way of acclimating your new members and orienting them to the board. Next step of the process is performing your needs assessment. So what I'm going to have you guys do right now is I'd like you to take out that SWOT analysis form. I realize that you know we don't have people here reporting out and giving you various data to input. So 
you know, I'll have you guys kind of work collaboratively, uh, collaboratively together. Work collaboratively together. Talk amongst yourselves. Fill out that. What are our greatest strengths of the district? Where are where do our weaknesses lie? Start filling that out because from there we're going to start fashioning out some goal categories and maybe even work towards prioritizing some of the uh, some of the information in there.
minutes or so. Over these, why don't we just stand up, stretch for a minute? I know you guys have seen it for a while, get blood flow into the brain. Oh, Cardinal? That might be it. Yeah. 
She went to uni, right? Yeah, she went to uni. That, that, that was my yeah. wife's best friend. Oh, yeah. They were just up in uh, the Yeah. So, very nice. Right, wait for Mary to get back and then start compiling what you guys came up with here. I'm just trying to coordinate something. All right, so we're going to go ahead here. So again, my attempt is just to kind of lead you on the path. You can certainly use the information that we're generating now as kind of a starting point, I should say, when you really sit down and decide that you're going to work on fashioning your goals. And I would suggest, if you haven't done it in the past, that you look towards scheduling a day where that's what you focus in on, a workshop designed towards fashioning out those goals. All right, so let's take a look at our SWOT analysis. We're going to start off with our strengths. What are the greatest strengths of this district that you believe them to be? What did you guys compile? I'll take anybody else. All right, what do you got for me, Beth? Uh, we have a highly qualified teaching staff. I'll give you a couple. Um, sure. We have a great teacher center. Okay. Just jump in. Yes. I have professional and dedicated personnel for a superintendent on that. All right, so we got... He's going to be all fancy, I guess. <laughs> I'm going to shake and scratch if that's okay. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> and then our, um, our CAP process and our guaranteed curriculum. It's our curriculum alignment process. Now, you mentioned something about a teacher center? Mm -hmm. no, we have a teacher center. John's teacher, teacher center. center. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, we have our own teacher center. Very cool. Our parents and our kids. Right. Alright, parents. Wait, what about parents and kids? Oh, um, naming them as one of the strengths. Engaged yeah, and active. Right. Parents and students. Excellent. Engaged and active. Which I thought that's a strength or a weakness, Bob. <laughs> I didn't want to say. <laughs> but sometimes they do get a little too active. Yeah, yeah, right. I really yeah. do, but I'll let you say. Supportive community. Supportive community, excellent. I have, um, I have, uh, well, high performing. All together, high performing, high graduation rate, yeah. lots of AP classes. Sure, yeah. Our extracurricular, yeah, 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 high nice. involvement in athletic yeah. And we have a strong financial position. Yeah, yeah. financial, financial stability. Financial strength. Yep. Our, our community is so kind of goes along with Bob. Socioeconomic environment is good. Uh, long range planning. Now, is that with your, your finances, long range planning? Or everything? everything. So Very nice. And that's the way to do it. Academics. All right. I'm sure we can go on for a day about the strength. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, we have uh, a high aspirational performance budget. Ah. Which is students graduating with 80 or 75 on ELA and that, which is a strong measure of graduation. graduation. Excellent. All right. Let's talk about one that. Uh, Never any fun. What do you perceive to be the weaknesses of the district? Well, I would say sort of what you said, and again, I don't want to say so strong, but sort of like those middle kids. I think sometimes, you know, maybe they, you know, we don't focus on that too much. Not okay. <laughs> <laughs> Different name for the same thing. Uh, absolutely. You know, okay. I think almost every school identifies those middle, you know, middle kids as being a group that's kind of always left out, so to speak. All right, so what else you got for me? just for a second because one of the things that you may decide to do now do you guys fashion board goals as well yeah, we have it. you have it. okay through this process you might even identify areas in which you as the board are going to want to collectively work towards and if you have and I, I think that uh, some of you if not all of you are kind of identifying that there's this perception out there and that reality is, is it isn't quite true what could you as a board do to help me dispel this. And I will say that this is something that a lot of boards grapple with, uh, perhaps almost every board. But you may decide collectively, you know what, we really don't want this perception to be out there. How can we maybe uh, advocate more transparency and really let the community know and get involved in what we're doing? 
you know, a lot of boards, they really, did you guys get a good turnout for your board meetings? Not really, no. Not really, I, I always joke around with boards, it's a kind of dumb joke, but I always say, if you want to bring people to your board meetings, just say you're thinking about cutting team sports and pack <laughs> room. I just say that jokingly, obviously. So that might be something, obviously, that you discover in your weaknesses that you can work towards as the board. I just kind of wanted to uh, pause there and just kind of share that. What else do we have about weaknesses? I think, you know, from going through today, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, 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 that our goals are, are, are just not where they need to be. Okay. Uh, and that they're not, you know, that we're not connected, you know, all the way down through with all the stakeholders. Absolutely, and that's really what we advocate in terms of the goal setting process is, you know, really you want to think about what is the greatest needs of this district. Because as the board, you are empowered through the goal setting process to improve that. And ultimately, as a school board, you're focused on student achievement. And the goals help improve that. Even if you say to yourself, well, you know what, we're a high performing district, there's always room for improvement. Always room for improvement. You just got to find it. Where are the best places to implement that? And so, goal setting. It's in, and, and along with that, we, we crunch a lot of numbers. We got a lot of data. So yeah. Don't use it. You know what I mean? It, it's very difficult. I mean, but but to get some real meaningful measurement systems, you know, that, that everybody agrees on part of those things. Absolutely. And really, if you look at the changing dynamics of education, and when it comes to data. You know, I mentioned before that we're data rich, but information poor, and slowly that is changing. Did you guys get a data dashboard? Say no. Yes, not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you followed anything about InBloom, which was uh, the Bill and, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, New York decided because of all of the parental concerns to, to do away with this central repository of student information. But there are other dashboards out there. So a really interesting one, if, I, if the name comes to me, I'll, I'll kind of relate to you. But the nice thing about data dashboards is that it does just that. It collects information about your students. And some of the dashboards that I've seen out there, it will be able to tell you how your students compare to any single school district within New York. You can uh, you know, disaggregate that data and break it down into smaller bits. We're now in a place where there are individuals within the district. And I kind of misspoke a little bit early with my, my example, but really ultimately what I was trying to drive out here is that the data becomes important. Utilize the resources that you have within the district to help you determine what are the important pieces of data that you need at the board level to help you make those decisions. For example, the goal setting. Help them, or have them disaggregate that data and bring it to you and say, you know, here's our student achievement, here's where, where we're at, but here is the, the disaggregated data, and here's going to show you the different subsects within the school district that, you know, and how they're performing. You know, maybe, and this is, you know, sort of a, a comment across the board, then you're going to realize that, you know what, we have this great new STEM facility, but realistically, if you look at our data, girls, females of this district, for whatever reason, are still not gravitating towards the maths and sciences. And that might be an area where you say, you know what, that, that could be an area of improvement because a lot of studies have shown boys are more apt to take those courses than, than not. So I just kind of throw that out there as food. We have that information through our student information system at the campus. So we have all the information. But one at the state was putting out always had a lag of two years. We actually do all this data throughout the year. And, and that's the beauty of it because you have it at your fingertips. Yeah. We use it, I'd say we use, we use data to inform a lot of different decisions. We just, I don't think that we look at it like in aggregate, we look yes. at aggregate scores versus the districts, we look at aggregate. Like the lack. Like lack, we also look at, like you were saying, the thing about the sociology class, the psychology class, that two people are we do that on a regular basis, on yeah. an annual basis. Absolutely. Like enrollment right. numbers. So I would say that, you know, we do use data, I would say that not like aggregate of data and say, oh, okay, well the girls' enrollment, we look at it to inform decisions, especially on the current Absolutely, and Mr. Nolte shared that with me that you know you are in your presentations you are provided that data, and that's awesome to hear. Well, I think one thing where and what I heard you guys say before, where we have a lack of data, is the post high school whether you know they're staying in college. And I know one thing for me: are they in the right placement? Not not only are they staying in college, but are 
have they been placed in the right career path or college path in the right school? And I know recently having gone through this as a parent, so this is a perceived weakness for me, where there's not that co collaboration. I know I struggled as a parent. It's much more complicated now, getting your kid to college. And so that collaboration with the school of helping them find not only the right college, but staying in that college, or if it's a different career path, finding what that right thing is for them, and, and just kind of knowing all those, those tools to Absolutely. help them out. And I think that we mentioned before is you know surveying those graduates because I think sometimes too is you, you want to understand what prompted them maybe if they did decide to leave college, why did they? Leave? Some kids decide to listen, you know, this isn't really for me right now. I'd rather do something else, you know, to be around college. And my parents said, don't do it. Me and my buddy decided we wanted to head out west. I wanted to see California bad. I wanted to see America, the greatest learning experience of my life. And I went to college the following year, and they were happy, but not so much. So. You know, having those third surveys will, will help get, you know, drive those decisions and understanding. Absolutely. All right, so we kind of got off the track a little bit here. So weaknesses, what else could we throw up here? Uh, I have a lack of economic growth in the Long Valley. Ah, uh, yes. Can I get that as a threat? I'm a guy's house, too. Not sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't use it. Yeah, so do I. Okay. And the comptroller now is coming out with those fiscal stress reports about every single school district. And, um, you know, basically, they're great indicators for you to look at in terms of sources of debt. If you notice that throughout the Mohawk Valley, you're right, this is an area that once boomed with the Erie Canal. And ever since then, all those old mill towns are kind of uh, going to come hard pressed. But you might also look at that on the flip side of that. Hopefully, maybe one day they're going to see that as economic opportunity. And you're going to start seeing that growth as well. I know in the area that I live in, you know, they're talking about that being the new Silicon Valley. Um, we're even talking about uh, here in Utica, there's a big business that's going to be we're talking about transplanting. It's all the chip, the chip. And the chip, yeah, yeah definitely had that undertaken. As soon as they built it, they realized that already it wasn't sufficient and they, they already had now. I mean, that whole area of Malta mm -hmm. is just booming. And it's incredible the amount of growth that they've undertaken. But that in itself, if you think about it, that's not too far away from here. And we're even talking about extending those types of industries towards this direction. And yeah. Utica is one of those places that they are talking yeah. about. And so that might be an area, let's put it towards opportunities. Yeah, it's Nano Utica. Is what the yes. Nano Utica. I like it. All right. So what else can we put up here? That capacity of state education department. I'm sorry, what was that? Capacity of state education. Department. Is it an opportunity or uh, No, I believe it's because they're being federally funded. 90% of their funds come from the federal government right now. They've been yes. dismantled in terms of staffing levels and just being able to implement the regions reform agenda. Oh, absolutely. Uh, state ed. And, you know, that, that's one of the big gripes about state ed, and especially, you know, I keep going back to the Common Core, is just the way that it was unfolded. And you know, Commissioner King had stood by it, but I think that we can all agree. A lot of these entities have been, you know, stripped away and are operating at a bare minimum. And you're 100 right. I mean, the funding that we got from the federal government to implement the Common Core quickly dried up in school districts. We're left kind of holding the bill to kind of uh, see it carried through. I guess if you want to call it that. What else can we put up here for weakness? Well, I have it sort of like a weakness and an opportunity. I think there's been some dissatisfaction with some aspects of our athletic program and we're going to be hiring a new athletic director, so I think that would be a weakness and then an opportunity. Now, athletics is always sort of a sore topic, so I don't want to dwell too far into it, but I mean, you're 100% correct. It, you know, um, some schools can't sustain their athletic programs, and, and as I kind of joked around before, I mean, people just come out and support them. And, uh, put it as uh, a weakness and, I'm sorry, a threat or an opportunity? New athletic directors. As an opportunity? Mm -hmm. Okay.
okay, that's definitely an opportunity. So the diversity They have a lot of AP on our courses, correct? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and again, that, that's something when you're doing this, you need to be cognizant of because as a high performing school district, that's probably part of the reason why. We talk about sustainability, and that's something that, you know, if you can hold on to it, that's an area in which you don't want to funnel some resources for it. I will say, as a side note here, as it kind of came up, there's an individual that used to work for NISBO. She graduated from here. I don't recall uh, this person's name. I never once. But um, that said that coming to this district was the best education share. I, I just wanted to pass that along to you. Absolutely. I don't think we have listed up there any of our special services, like on the learning disability side and that kind of thing. And I don't know where you would put that. Um, I think it's a strength, but it could also be a weakness. We may be lacking some areas, and it could also be an opportunity. I will so throw out there from the, from, the, from the DP side of things. So just from my experience, it's uh, it's excellent. I mean, so you got it's, a, it's a definite strength. It's our, our department is it's very, very strong. Comprehensive program. Yeah. What about from the achievement side? We think we might, you know, kind of say, all right, now we would count ourselves as a high performing district. Our students do very well on those state assessments. But are there weaknesses embedded in there? I, I think there's two. Um, one, one, and again, that, it, 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 what's going to happen? One of them is, uh, and it goes through threats and opportunities as well. Um, uh, you know, as a subgroup in performance, um, our economically uh, challenged kids are not doing as well as their peers, which goes to the threat, which is the demographics changing in our district, which goes to an opportunity, you know, to staying ahead of that changing demographic and making sure that uh, that we're ahead of that in, in giving those kids uh, what they need. Uh, the second thing I'd say is uh, regarding weaknesses is I think I think sometimes not all the time but I think we uh, have a tendency to be complacent with uh, with the achievement uh, that we that we have here. Okay, that so we can't get better. Uh, Where we want to put that in the weakness side? Yeah. I'll okay. Put, perfect. Put the weakness side. Um, the, the the amount of. Uh, of uh, Economic disadvantaged kids has doubled over the last five years wow. in the school. Now, do you have specific programs in place currently that sort of addresses the changing uh, dynamics of the population? As you see, sort of more socioeconomic uh, disadvantaged individuals coming into the district. I think that's the opportunity. And that's the opportunity to create programs that would uh, kind of focus on that. Focus on that blip. Focus, focus on that. You know, it's given us a little bit of a, a nudge in the measurement area, mm -hmm. and it's given us a little bit of nudge in the percentage uh, increasing. And so, you know, the opportunity is to, oh, hey, you know, it's not bad. It's not really a, a problem. But hey, it's something to be thinking about in the future that we got to stay at. Absolutely. And you really kind of hit the nail on the head, so to speak, in terms of the work. Is to be that forward focus entity, to be cognizant of the changing dynamics of the district and really through the goal setting process. If you determine, you know what, we see this sort of not as a, a problem now, but potentially if we have sort of more of an influx, how are we going to, as a district, handle that to, be, you know, to ensure that these students are going to succeed? And it may be a point where you say, you know what, maybe we should take a look at some programs right now. And maybe start implementing. 
I might just point it out as a, you know, a seed of thought, and that's really a uh, conversation that needs to go a lot deeper than sort of what we have right now. Let's skip over, what are some other threats externally to the district that you really have no control over whatsoever? I think that we talked about one of them, I didn't put it down underneath the threat, but that is sort of the diminishing economy here in the Mohawk Valley. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, changes in state mandates, also unfunded. <laughs> yeah. Property tax account. That, and that's going to be sort of compiled by the, the, the tax freeze incentive. It's the legislative caps because there's multiple ones now. Yes, there are. Yeah. And how this is all going to work out, uh, we're all still waiting to see. They kind of have a, a preliminary plan, but exactly what does that entail for school districts that are going to you know, abide by this you know, quote-unquote property cap freeze, it remains to be seen. Tax for sharing is another one. Oh, yes. I would say I'm also um, Comcore. Our district is a little bit polarized by Comcore. And you're going to find that uh, all over. But just as a side note here, did you guys have a lot of individuals this past school year that quote-unquote opt-out? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Pest refusal, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's always the sticking point. That there's no such thing as an opt-out. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to go down that path. Yeah, I know. You're under say correct. So, okay, so we'll, we'll definitely put that down here. Um, Can we add up here? Common Core is creating no teaching model. Oh, okay, good. Let's put that down. Want to put a weakness? Yes. I think it's a weakness and it's a threat to more teachers leaving the okay. career. Okay. switch years. I think we're definitely on the right path. One of the things I'm going to urge you to do is that when you really uh, come together again in that workshop setting is that you not only hammer out the process that you definitely want to undertake and sort of solidify that agreement amongst yourselves, but start bringing in some more of the data to get a clearer picture of how the students are performing, more of the perception data. But I kind of just want to show you that next step in the process in the sense that after you've kind of compiled your needs assessment, looked at the district inside and out, the next step of the process is to start thinking, well, okay, given the data that we've generated here, what are some goal categories that we could create that we can start plugging these into that in essence can become some of our overarching goal areas? And I'm just going to move these real quick over here so we can see them so I have room to write. Now we can put them up here, and I will say you're not bound to, you know, the goal areas that I come up with or we come up with right now, you're obviously not bound to them. When you, you know, take this again, you can determine, well, you know what, I didn't like this, but let's at least kind of go through the process a little bit further. So we're looking for commonalities amongst the various things that we came up with. If we had to categorize these, what are some headers that we could use to do so? Well, I hate to be redundant, but... Increasing student achievement. Excellent. So we could have student achievement, and I'm going to write goal category. What other goal categories could we carve out of there? Maintain fiscal stability. Mm -hmm. Okay, we could have that be, you know, I'm looking for just kind of a one word entity, so we'll put. Um, Fiscal. And that could be a goal category. Transfer and communication. Communication or there we go, communication. 
that doesn't necessarily have to be with the community, but also internal communication as well. But if, if I were to give you my two cents, I might want to make culture a separate category, but that's entirely up to you. Do you want me to put it next to communication? No, no, or? Culture. 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 Because we don't have to include all these right. goals, because we only want right. two, we don't want yeah, would, would curriculum be one, or is that two? Student um, you know what, I almost see them hand in hand, but I might want to create a separate category that specifically addresses curriculum I'm and instruction. I'm like thinking about just like the whole, I'm almost like common core, so almost like, Something it's yeah. so big, I don't know. And like I said, right now, all we're doing is we're just kind of brainstorming categories. Whether or not you want to use them, it's up to you. I'm going to write it down up here anyway, and you might decide further down the road, well, it's really more under student achievement. But I have seen a lot of districts that do have it as a separate goal category. And I will say also, that, you know, you can create as many goal categories as you see fit. I wouldn't create, you know, 20, 30 of them. But you, you, you definitely want to create ones that you believe encompasses the areas that you're going to be looking at. And just because, say for example, you come up with seven goal categories, that doesn't mean you have to create a goal for every single one of these. Through the process of plugging in the information from our SWOT analysis, you're going to prioritize that in terms of what is the area that needs the most attention. And from there, collectively, you might decide, you know what, here is something, and I'm just gonna, because this one kind of stuck out in me, and say, we realize that we have sort of a changing uh, population here, and that we're seeing a further influx of students in it. And that's really concerning because you want to maintain that high that's level really achievement. Yeah. We're, we're, I mean, that's, that's I'm just using that as an example. I, I'm probably blowing it much out of proportion yeah, than needs to be. I got the data. I got the data, and, it, and, and it's something that you know. Again, one of the things you know, we can't be resistant to to, to understanding that it's gone from four percent to over eight percent in five years. It's still a very low number. It's still a very low number compared to all of our schools. I guess I need to see that data. Sure, the state puts it out. I got it. I just don't carry it with me all the time. Just when we look at why we weren't on the U.S. News and World Ranking, when we were on it, we were at six percent, and then we dropped to four percent. And that caused us to have a higher percentage of students, and I think they were at 97 percent. But we still didn't get that cut off of us, of that one component of it. So that was actually declining on that report. So we have contradictory information. So I okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's so absolutely. Comparison. It's online. I'll send it to you guys. Yeah. You know. No, I'm sure it's there because there, there are so many different data points out there. I'm sure there's something that demonstrates that. It's just we've got the opposite effect on that other. So I'd like to see it so we can do it from there. Absolutely. And yeah, I just kind of want to interject here just very briefly is that, you know, one of the caveats of looking at the data is that if you say today it's at 8%, I don't want to get off really, the, this is for your, you know, your discussion here, but for example, if today it's at 8%, you know, what was it a year ago, what was it three years ago, and, and what are the projections? Yeah, what's NATO you going to do? Right. Yeah. You know, if anything. So, yeah, I mean, you know, these are all things that, you know, we want to be cognizant of. If, you know, Utica, you know, Nano Utica does come to fruition, obviously, this area probably most realistically will benefit. You know, some a further influx, but in the same degree, is you want to be cognizant of the trends and always be sort of forward focused in that degree. I was just going to say technologically advanced schools would be a goal category. Okay, good. So let's put down just a broad category of technology. Technology, technologically advanced schools. Also, have extracurricular. We have athletics listed as a weakness and/or opportunity, so you could broaden it just even by overriding extracurricular activities. Something I wrote down at home, and I didn't mention it here, and that nobody else mentioned either, was to enhance safe schools. Ooh, safe schools. Now, where do we want to put that? Is that for or no? Uh, that really depends upon where you want to place it. You, you might determine that it does fall underneath culture. We talked about example. like instilling a culture of safety in the school. You know, no. safe school climate. 
Yeah, and the, yes, absolutely. So that I, I would might want to lump that under culture, and that's up to you for you to decide. Any other categories that we could carve out of here? I can think of one more. Personnel. Because we talked about teachers wanting to keep and retain high quality teachers and staff members within the district. So we might want to look at that. And then, you know, I, I don't want to plant a seed for conversation, but say, for example, hypothetical, that you're noticing in the district that you're seeing teachers and it's kind of becoming a little bit of a revolving door that you got good teachers come in they're using it more or less kind of a stepping stone and again this is hypothetical i'm sure this isn't happening here but that's an area maybe you want to create a goal set out of it to say you know what we want to keep and retain high quality teachers therefore this is our goal set area how can we put uh you, you know what are the uh, action steps that we can put into place to retain them do they need more professional development anything along that line. So I'll give you that one. I'd say that one of our core values to recruit and retain high performing teachers. That's one of our core values. Excellent. And that's tied to your values. And oftentimes, these goals are tied to things like your values. And we go back to the beginning of the presentation. That's why I went through the vision and the mission, your priorities, because a lot of times they are tied to that. I don't know if this would be a, I mean, I think this is more of a board goal, yes. but I think the board needs to work better together. I don't think we're all working on this as part of the same team, so I think that would be a good board goal. Okay, so again, what I'm going to suggest, and again, it's a mere suggestion for a conversation later, I think that we kind of pinpointed some areas collectively as a board you feel are weaknesses, one of them being maybe the transparency perception, another one being maybe that you're not a as a cohesive unit as you possibly could. Following up on that last piece, and I'll offer this as another suggestion, I don't want you to think I'm trying to sell you on another board retreat. I will say that there are a lot of individuals out there that facilitate board workshops, but if collectively you feel there are issues bubbling under the surface, my suggestion would be don't let them fester. Most likely what's gonna happen if you do, they're just gonna become exponentially worse. That if you wanna get on the same page, maybe have a board retreat and the focus is uh, more focused on team building, kind of getting the issues out into the open and discussing them and, and coming to some sort of resolution. Now is the great, you know, between now and the beginning of the school year, it is a really prime opportunity to do that. The other piece of it too is that you have a new board member. Whenever you even get one new member, it changes the dynamics of the entire team. And sometimes if you hold a retreat where you are focusing in on maybe your operations, how you conduct business, as well as interpersonal relationships, it's a great way to acclimate your new membership to the board, and it helps to get them on page in terms of, you know, I don't know how you feel right now, but you may feel overwhelmed thinking that, you know, you need to know X, Y, and Z all at once, and, you know, realistically, there's a huge steep learning curve to, to board service, and I'm sure, you know, James over there, 16 years, he probably learned something new, um, probably every day, there's no extent to it. So I just offer that as a suggestion, just because it, it, because it came up. I was told my first year on the board, just listen. <laughs> and, and you know, I, that used to be uh, what they told board members. I'm a big advocate for orientation programs. I don't know what you have in place in terms of acclimating your new memberships, uh, you know, new members to it. You need to think of board work as sort of a second profession in the sense that any profession that you enter into needs training. I think oftentimes that at the board level, because you're all well-educated adults, the, the thought process is they can figure it out on their own <laughs> and just be quiet and listen for the first year before you say anything. Um, you, know, you may want to, think, you know, through this process, take a step back and think, you know, how do we orient our new members? Is it adequately preparing them to allow them to come to the table to participate in those discussions, or are we trying to play a lot of catch-up? Um, so I'll just throw that to your lamp. So I would say almost that it sounds like maybe at some point you're going to want to maybe fashion some board goals for yourself. And if you do so, kind of think of the similar lines of what we talked about here. How can we measure that? I didn't think I would have to use this, but one way you can do that, on the left-hand side in your uh, folder, there's a meeting observation form. 
You can do this once, you can do it periodically throughout the year, but this is a great way to look at how you're conducting business. You might decide that, you know what, I'm just gonna make up a date. On our February 3rd board meeting, we're gonna, at the end of this meeting, fill out this observation form. And you wanna use it as feedback. So if you do establish goals, how do you know if you're working towards them? Well, this is one instrument that will help you measure that type of growth. Board goals are excellent because there's always room for improvement. And it's a good way to help everybody get on page and to work towards that unity that really is an earmark of high performing uh, school boards. Yes, I'm done. Right the wrap up stage, I've read your mind. So just to kind of wrap things up, and really what I did today was lead you through that cycle. And I'll reiterate the importance of collaboratively sitting down, going over what I presented today, figuring out what works for you and developing a blueprint for a process. It does not need to be set in stone because you may decide as you're going through that process some tweaking needs to happen. My suggestion would be pick a day in which you're going to just focus in on setting goals to bring in a little bit more of the data, but to do essentially what we did up here. Take a look at your collective thoughts, create those categories, use the information that you generated plug them into the various headings, and then decide within those areas what are our greatest needs. Where can we improve the most? And it's really once you will that down and determine what are maybe the three, five areas that need the attention, that's what you're gonna turn into your board goals. Once you turn them into the board goals, the superintendent will help fat, uh, fashion out the objectives. How can we work towards that? And then it's really incumbent upon the superintendent to formulate the action plan. The superintendent does not work alone. He's gonna reach out and use the resources that he has internally in order to make that happen. You get the feedback, you monitor, you progress, you support, and this becomes your cycle. Any last questions that you have for me? I, I would hope that when you do the goals that you look at them very carefully so that you know that they can be achieved. Absolutely need to be realistic. Right. We always say they're just far enough out of reach, they're just close enough where you can achieve them. I hope hard to agree. So we don't, obviously this is a big undertaking. Yes. Uh, is it fair to say we can take our time to do this? Or is this something that this doesn't need to be rushed per se, a lot of, especially because if you're looking to revamp your entire process, uh, I mentioned it before, it probably will be a little bit more lengthy this year, because again, you want to come to an agreement of how you're going to go about doing it. I mean, you can definitely use the plan that I've laid out for you. I mean, really, that's those are best practices. Maybe develop a timeline. Um, you know, when do you like to see it set? But most boards will, you know, use between August, September, October. That's really the time period where boards will set goals. So if you do have some time to work, it depends on how fast you really want to hammer this through. Absolutely. Any other questions? What do you want to I was going to ask you if you could just do that now. It's anonymous. Sure. I thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, thank you, man. You guys were excellent. Yeah, yeah. Welcome. Thank you. When you're done with those, just hold it up and I'll call it around and get it. Um, do you want me to, to type this stuff up for you? Or do you guys want to hold on to this? It's up to you. You can type it up. I'll type it up. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I knew that was, I knew that was coming. <laughs> that was, it's a rhetorical question. I should have just it's, said, here you go. Okay, good enough. I'll definitely type up a reflective piece and